Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox again, Big Data Applications and Analytics course. And we're in the third uh, unit on cloud computing, a techno technology part of the course. And we're covering architectures, applications, and the systems that uh, support that. And we're actually doing applications in this lesson, so called Science Cloud, with, of course, applications imply a discussion of the system needed to support them. We have some applications from science and also a discussion of the so-called Internet of Things. As far as clouds are concerned, we have a much longer a whole uh, unit on the Internet of Things or sensors. All right, so let's look at how scientific computing is done. Uh, so, so if we look at uh, what you what you have. A large amount of science is done on supercomputers. These are very big. Uh, they have multi-core nodes uh, linked by uh, high-performance low-latency networks, maybe up to a billion, a million cores. And uh, increasingly, these have GPU enhancements to get very high performance on each node. And they're designed to be highly suitable for parallel simulations, uh, calculating combustion, fusion. Climate, things like that. Astrophysics, beginning of the universe, what have you. Then we have so-called high throughput systems, which is typified by the European Grid Initiative in Europe or the Open Science Grid in in the United States, and they're aimed at largely so-called pleasingly parallel jobs, where you have a huge a huge amount of computing, but the computing is made up of individual separate jobs. Um, a uh, good example is actually went through in the physics module, the so-called in the Large Hadron Collider data analysis, uh, with I think about you know uh, sometimes 300,000 cores simultaneously analyzing uh, the physics data from the LHC. An interesting concept here is cycle stealing, because you don't need careful synchronization between the different jobs. You can run them very asynchronously on, on, on nodes without, which don't have strong guarantees on, uh, on how fast they do the job. And so you can actually uh, take your favorite university or company and uh, run these jobs in the background when people are not using their workstations or, and uh, they're available for use. And the other concept here is grids, which is a uh, Somehow, sometimes grids, as you see from the name here, grids are actually equivalent to high throughput systems, but in general, they're different. Um, and they federate resources. They take a bunch of different uh, machines or clusters, what have you, around the world and join them together to be a single resource. And uh, they allow you various features, more resources, access to multiple backends. So if one's busy, you go to the other, and so on. All of these um, environments are built nowadays on a computing model, which involves services, uh, which uh, do what you want to be done. And they have portals, which make access convenient. And they have workflow, which integrates multiple processes into a single job. Workflow, if you remember, was called orchestration, uh, where we were discussing the uh, 21 layers of HPC ADDS. And when you're doing computing, uh, synchronization is very important. So if we now want to try to compare clouds, high performance computing, and grids, one of the areas they'll differ is in synchronization. And the, the cost it takes to uh, two entities in the, in the um, system to communicate with each other. And in general principles, grids have the slowest communication or synchronization cost, or the larger synchronization cost, because their nodes are just a long way apart. And you have a supercomputer, the nodes are all close together, both physically and logically, with high performance networking. And clouds are sort of in between. They don't go to the, because they virtualize, they don't tend to stress locality and very, very uh, uh, good message passing, but they're still pretty good. So we have this. Um, 
um, rating, the grids are the slowest, clouds are the next slowest, and the classic supercomputers are the fastest in the synchronization area. So because of this statement here, the grids are slower than clouds, clouds can actually run effectively any grid workload. Uh, however, clouds cannot run any HPC workload. Of course, this inequality sort of implies that subject to the memory sizes and disk sizes, any HPC system can run whatever a grid can run or whatever a cloud can run. Uh, well, I must say the data limitation could be rather serious. But as far as synchronization is concerned, that is true. That may still may not be a good idea. Because maybe the uh, supercomputer has spent a lot of money on its on its on reducing synchronization costs, and that's not relevant if you're running a whole bunch of pleasingly parallel jobs. So you typically use this um, technology called MPI on HPC machines, and it offers the highest possible performance on closely coupled problems. So we actually there have now four forms of MapReduce, which we've gone through uh, in the past. There is the so-called Map Only, which is pleasingly parallel. Then you just run in the maps are essentially compute jobs, which may of course read from disk, but they don't communicate. So the map is uh, equivalent to Map Only is pleasingly parallel. Then you have classic MapReduce, which is supported by the simplest versions of Hadoop. We have maps followed by reductions, and everything is written to this, and so provides fault tolerance. The next um, uh, technology is iterative map reduce, which is uh, very effective in data mining, because there you have the same map followed by reduce, or map in general followed by collective um, model, but the um, but the, uh, it, uh, you have lots of iterations, and so for that reason, you cannot afford to write to this. You have to send, <coughs> communicate the <coughs> synchronization uh, needed and the data needed, which needs to be moved from one, one map to a different map. That has to be done very fast. And so that's where you have iterative map produce. Data mining like clustering is, um, uh, must use that type of technology. Um, you then, I mean, technically, you so-called cache the data, which is you keep it in memory between iterations, and you support uh, what these are typically used as various collective, what's called collective communication, which is communication where all the nodes get together to do some important single thing, which is like a reduction operation, sum up the results of all the nodes and store them in in the one node, or store them actually in all nodes. That's all reduced. Scattering data from one node to all the nodes, gathering multicast, which is a variant of broadcasting. Then you have a, a final form of MapReduce, is actually just classic MPI, which is uh, similar to iterative MapReduce, except the messaging is, tends not to be collectives, but rather tends to be point-to-point um, -point messages. Node A sends a message to node B. And that's what you tend to see in simulations, because discretizing the differential operators in, uh, used in uh, either particle dynamics or differential equations, that uh, produces point-to-point -point messaging, because you only have a few linked nodes from that discretization, which is what the messaging has to communicate. So if you go to clouds, what works? Well, we move um, pleasingly parallel works, because uh, in fact, grids work for pleasingly parallel. And we can say that you know we can have, uh, because clouds are better than the grids, we can do modestly parallel instead of, as well as pleasingly parallel. Things which are not quite independent. Um, so these are roughly independent data being processed. Or roughly independent, or essentially independent simulations, where all you're doing is gathering together global measures of, uh, of which uh, tell you about the overall thing that went on. And uh, here you have the long tail of science, the integration of uh, distributed sensors, sensors as we all, as we discuss in the uh, module on the Internet of Things. They're very suitable for clouds because. Uh, 
One sensor is nationally connected to one virtual uh, process in the cloud, and that can be done uh, elastically, and so you can process very dynamic sensor environments. Um, so we know the commercial data analytics, which like um, search, like uh, recommender engines, those uh, those actually map into MapReduce very well. Sorry, can be implemented as MapReduce very well. Um, and um, we also have, uh, as we mentioned, when we come to clustering, we have iterative variants of MapReduce to do to do the uh, more sophisticated data mining. And who is using um, clouds? Well, there was Venus C, which I no longer is running, and which is Azure project in Europe. They had 27 applications, which essentially did very, very straightforward, um, uh, almost infrastructure as a service only, using Azure. Um, if you look at uh, Future Grid, which is just a which has a strong focus on clouds, or did have a strong focus on clouds, I should say. 50% uh, of the applications done on FutureGrid came from Life Science, which says Life Science is a major cloud user, because Life Science um, is a uh, field that um, has a lot of pleasingly parallel problems. I should say Life Science is an example of the longish tail of science. There's lots and lots of biologists. They each often analyze a modest amount of data, and you have to analyze all that data, and that gives you lots of independent jobs, which is characteristic of the long tail of science. It's interesting to see that the Lilly, the local pharmaceutical corporation, does its chemistry computations on clouds to get elasticity. So when they need a lot of computing, they go off to the cloud and do it. As far as I know, that is not done academically. So uh, we've made these comments on the Internet of Things many times. Uh, they're meant to be by 2020, 24 to 75 billion devices. I prefer a number near, near the smaller end. That seems to be more consistent with what I see going on now. I think the larger number comes from uh, declaring things to be part of the Internet of Things, which are only rather indirectly part of the Internet of Things. When you have a, a thing like a refrigerator or even a car, it may only have one device connected to the Internet, but a lot of internal devices which are linked together internally on a network. So there's some ambiguity as to what you consider a thing. Is the thing only the things connected to the network, or does it also include um, in, internal uh, uh, sub-things which communicate with a major thing which goes off to the network? So clouds are very natural here, because for the reason I already explained, that um, things are small. The data they produce is very, it tends to be small. It is natural to um, process it uh, on a single core, and therefore you can just use the elasticity of the cloud to uh, uh, support sensors or, in, or things as they come and go. Uh, so we have smartphones as the simplest example now. Gaming consoles are a good example. Webcams are a good example. They're, but there are also projects like Intelligent River, Smart Towns. We'll just cover that actually a little in our late module on the Internet of Things. Ubiquitous cities, and they're all built around the vision of just a, a slew of small devices radiating back data to the cloud. Robotics is an interesting area because robots have limited internal compute, uh, compute capability, so they can use a backup cloud uh, to, can, to um, make decisions. So your Google self-driving car can go back to the cloud to get data, new maps, and things like that, uh, and that they might need to make the best possible decisions. So if you look at the Internet of Things, um, a large number are not science, but many of them are. Uh, things are naturally parallel over, and they say they tend to therefore develop, generate pleasingly parallel applications. Also, it's worth noticing that things are distributed. They're not all in one place. They can be controlled by a cloud in one place, but they themselves are distributed. So you have a grid 
the things in the cloud that do the processing. Uh, finally, uh, I wanted to introduce the term of streaming. Uh, we'll discuss those uh, uh, later on. And uh, also, we discussed them in the uh, 51 use case uh, section, uh, where we pointed out 80% of those applications involve some sort of streaming. And uh, streaming corresponds to data in, mo data in motion and the things are a very natural way to get data in motion because things take data and very rarely do you want the data left on the thing. You want it sent back to be to be integrated with other data from other things and to make support decisions. So you always get streaming with things and they say our naivest model is you stream from the thing to the cloud. Um, so if we look at where the devices are, smartphones are currently one of the largest sources. But you can even think of people as part of the Internet of Things. When they tweet, they're, sent, they're doing these erratic time series, which are carrying a relative, relatively small um, size payload for each um, each event. And that's class. That's also seen when you tweet or when you log into your cloud and search. So these are all streaming applications. We'll mention uh, this. We mentioned the software already. Apache Storm is critical for this type of software. And um, it, it allows you to gather and integrate multiple erratic, namely not specially synchronized uh, streams. And there's lots of fascinating computer science to do the algorithms to analyze this data. So that's a very quick overview. There's more detail on this in other places in, in my, uh, my website and things. And it tells you how science and uh, technical computing can be done on the cloud. Thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox signing out. Hello, this is Jeffrey here on the last slide of uh, this third unit, lesson seven on cloud computing. And this is a slide we've seen before. It comes from uh, this uh, investment firm, KPCB. and. Um, it's, a, it's their estimate of the number of MEM systems, micro electromechanical systems from various sources. And we see mobile phones are the largest source. This is the light blue here. And uh, by 2013, we're getting up to 8 billion. And it is growing 30% a, a, a year, but um, you're probably not going to get much above 20 billion by. Um, 2020 or 25 billion from this type of source. Because if you look at the later estimates, they don't go past that the number. So when we wrote down 24 to 75, the people with 75 were probably um, using some method, different method of estimation. I mentioned some possibilities they were looking at. Um, uh, sub devices stored in a in where there, there's only one thing connected to the internet and each had several little devices it controlled things like that. Still, this is a pretty big number. It's uh, very important. All this data. I mean, whenever you, your smartphone only works well because of the cloud. It's only smart because of the cloud. Gets all this intelligence from the cloud and. Sends back all your uh, emails and uh, Facebook uh, Facebook entries and tweets, and it sends them to the cloud to, to do whatever you want to get done. So uh, this this is um, this this summarizes a very important trend, and so I'm not too worried about showing it several times. Thank you very much. That ends this uh, last uh, slide on lesson seven of the third unit on cloud computing. Thank you very much.